Welcome to Houston House at South by Southwest. Climate change is one of the most pressing challenges of our time. Its impact on the environment, the global population, and the economy are undeniable. Today, the energy industry is preparing to meet the growing demand for affordable and reliable energy while lowering the world's carbon footprint. But how do we ensure an equitable transition for all? We must ensure all people have access to reliable, affordable energy, and the industry must aid in remediating the negative social, economic, and health impacts on those historically underserved by the energy system. Join thought leaders as they discuss the economic inequities impacting our community and how we can all work to establish a roadmap for an equitable energy transition. Hi, I'm Jane Stricker, Executive Director of the Houston Energy Transition Initiative with the Greater Houston Partnership. And I'm pleased to be joined today by two incredible thought leaders in the energy equity space. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about me, I have been with BP for about 21 years before I retired at the end of last year and joined the Greater Houston Partnership to lead the Energy Transition Initiative. It's a fantastic opportunity to support our business community and our communities in driving the energy transition forward. I'd like to hand it to John Hall to introduce himself. Uh, John Hall, I uh, currently serve as president of the Houston Advanced Research Center, a research and policy analysis organization that was founded by uh, George Mitchell about 40 years ago. Uh, we are especially working on climate justice and climate resiliency issues today. Uh, prior to, to going to HARC, I had worked uh, on energy and environmental issues for about 30 years. A long time ago, I headed up what is now the, the uh, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Spent years, a number of years, doing consulting on the same issues. And prior to coming to, to HARC, I, I uh, serve as Associate Vice President at Environmental Defense Fund, especially working on climate issues as well as uh, vehicle electrification initiatives. Uh, thank you for having me. Hi, my name is Dana Harmon. I'm uh, the now former executive director of the Texas Energy Poverty Research Institute. Um, we are a, a nonprofit research institute based here in Austin with a mission to inspire lasting energy solutions for underserved communities across our state. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be here and thank you very much to the partnership in, in Houston House for this opportunity and focus on this important topic. Um, you know, we're, we're here because we have the incredible opportunity and responsibility to, to set the, the energy course for future generations, um, and focusing on equity is no doubt a critical part of, of that discussion. Our organization works with uh, entities across the energy sector, from utilities to affordable housing providers, social service organizations, state, local, and federal governments, to really think about how can we make sure that the benefits of this energy transition are available for, for all across our state and across our country. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Dana. So when he, the Greater Houston Partnership launched the Houston Energy Transition Initiative, last year, one of the, the key areas of focus is around ensuring an equitable energy transition. And so we'll spend a little bit of time today talking about what that means uh, and how that plays out, particularly in Houston. And so in order to do that, I just want to set a little bit around landscape. Uh, I think there's a couple of key things that, that are good to, to understand up front. Um, you know, I think one of the key areas to understand is that Houston and, and Texas more broadly are facing increasing impacts of climate change, uh, more so than a lot of other areas of the country. Um, you know, as we see more and more hurricanes, stronger storms with greater frequency and significant impacts to communities and quite often to less advantaged communities. It's also the energy capital of the world which means it's also one of the highest industrial areas in the region. Um, you know, they have some of the, the uh, greatest CO2 emissions associated with industrial activity in and around the port area uh, and along the Gulf Coast. And then finally, the energy industry has been good for Houston 
from the standpoint of jobs and opportunity, not just jobs in energy, but the related jobs that come along with having a booming energy economy. And so when we talk about an equitable energy transition, we sort of need to think about it in, in a couple of lenses. There's the emissions impact lens, which is about clean air, clean water, reduced CO2 emissions impact. But there's also access to energy in all of its forms, whether it be traditional energy sources, renewable energy sources, um, and then even with respect to transportation, and access to that for all communities. And then finally, workforce, and, and what that means for jobs and the communities where this these businesses operate in Houston. And so, you know, I, I just, to start things off, would love to hear from each of you sort of what got you into this space um, and, and what you see as sort of the, the key um, areas of focus within your uh, scope of work. I'm, I'm almost inclined to defer to Dana because Dana, in many ways, got me working on these issues. <laughs> so. And I'm fortunate to, uh, to have been able to, to work with you, to, to call you a friend and colleague for many years now, John. Um, so, you know, I, it's interesting. I, I left this out of my background, but I, I come from the oil and gas space um, on the, the exploration and, and production side. And, and really, you know, I, I got into energy originally because I do think that energy is, is really fundamental to every aspect of our economy, to, to, to lifting um, people and countries out of poverty and, and is really critical to, to building the society as we know it today. Um, but, you know, there's a lot to think about um, in the energy sector. And um, at, at TEPRI, with our organization, our work focuses on energy affordability, reliability, and sustainability, and the intersection of, of those th three things for all communities. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's about quality of life for people. Um, it's about comfort. It's about access to opportunity. And, and really, how can we, as an industry, as a sector, make sure that we are promoting environments for, for healthy and thriving communities through energy? Um, really, we, we kind of think about the energy transition in, in four key ways, um, very similar to, to what you set up, uh, Jane. Um, and the first is really addressing energy affordability. Um, and that is, is kind of, as an organization, our, our bread and butter. You know, when we started uh, this organization back in 2015, we were really looking a lot at energy cost burdens and the, the trade-offs that people make in order to try to keep the lights on. 41% um, of households in Texas are, are considered low income, um, meaning below 80% uh, of area median income. And we know that people, um, low income people, pay more for energy in terms of share of wallet. Uh, the average energy burden in Texas is about 2%, but for low income households, um, that, that average is about 10%, so five times greater in terms of share of resources just to keep the lights on. Um, so we think it's really incredibly important that we, that we think about the affordability aspects of, of this energy transition and importantly, how costs are being distributed as we move through the trans transition. Secondly, we think about energy resilience. Um, you know, Winter Storm Uri last February exposed uh, vulnerabilities in our energy system that many of us never thought were possible. Um, and, and, you know, many of us experienced energy insecurity for the first time in our lives, you know, not having access to the energy that we, we need uh, to keep our homes and our families comfortable. Um, so we need to make sure that we're, we're putting systems in place so that um, everyone has access to energy when, when they need it. Um, thirdly, as, as Jane mentioned, we do think about the clean energy economy and we think about jobs. Um, as we think about energy cost burdens, there's, there's really kind of a, a numerator and a denominator there, right? There's, there's the cost of energy and then household income. And we have an opportunity as we're moving through this energy transition for good family sustaining jobs. But we need to make sure that we're focusing on making sure that there's uh, equitable uh, access to participation and that we're broadening participation and there are a lot of different ways to do that. And then finally, as Jane mentioned, we need to think about the environmental justice components um, of our energy transition. We need to think about who's most impacted, not just by our generation of the energy sector, but who's most impacted and most vulnerable to extreme weather events like we experienced with, uh, with Hurricane, Her um, excuse me, with, with Winter Storm Yuri, uh, Yuri but also Hurricane Harvey. Um, so th those are kind of several ways that we're thinking about this very complex topic of the energy transition and how we promote equity. Um. 
a little background. I keep wanting to move this. I was told that I couldn't move this, so, so let me stop trying to do that. Uh, a little background uh, in, in terms of context, how I've, how I've gotten to this place. Uh, when I was at the State Environmental Agency, we, we faced for probably the first time the largest air quality issues we had faced, uh, especially in the Houston region and in the Dallas-Fort Worth region. And, and in, in trying to figure out how we could move forward to address those air quality issues, there were two facts became apparent. One, most of our pollution problems come from energy, how we, how we produce it and how we use it. And, 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 and uh, uh, at the time, we were focused on ozone precursors, nitrogen oxides, and volatile organic compounds. And all of the model and the research that I was privy to see showed that reducing those emissions was contingent upon figuring out how to reduce emissions in, from cars, trucks, and buses associated with the energy that was being used, but also at, in, in, in commercial and industrial facilities based on the energy that they were using. And then over the past uh, several years, I worked at Environmental Defense Fund and was focused on climate issues and, and came to recognize that when it comes to climate change, uh, energy, particularly fossil energy, is in large part the driver of the climate change problems that we have. And so how we manage energy, um, particularly going forward, has a lot to do with uh, the quality of life, the, the health that people will enjoy if you're living uh, close to a freeway associated with traffic emissions, or you're living in a community where there are large refineries and petrochemical facilities nearby. But likewise, to the degree that we can reduce emissions that are driving climate change. It all depends on how we manage energy in the future. So I'm, I'm excited about this energy transition because it provides, and in, 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 in all of the previous years when I was working with companies and local governments on trying to improve, to reduce ozone levels, you know, everybody talked about the phenomenal cost associated with that. And, and I remember working in the early 2000s and Jane, this was before our, you got involved in these issues, but uh, the, 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 the Texas Environmental Agency after I left promulgated regulations that said, hey, refiners and petrochemical facilities in, in the Houston area along the Gulf Coast and, 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 and electric, electric uh, power plants all across the state, you've got to reduce your, nox, your nitri nitrogen oxide emissions by eight, first 90 percent and then it went to 80 percent. And you also have to reduce if your refinery or your, or your, or your petrochemical facility, you got to reduce your VOCs by around 65 percent. And, 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 and everybody screamed for good reason because they had never faced a mandate like that, that mandate like that before. And they said, if you make us do this, we will all have to shut down our facilities and move elsewhere. Uh, George, George W. Bush was governor, and those regulations were put in place. And guess what happened because of innovation and technology? Nobody shut down. And I think Ann will testify that practically every refinery and every chemical facility along the Gulf Coast has substantially expanded at least once, but potentially two, three, and four times, with billions of dollars being invested. And the reason why is because through technology and innovation, uh, the companies figured out a way to produce more, make more money, uh, substantially increasing their income uh, because they were put in a box where they had to figure it out. This, with regard to the transition, the energy transition that we're underway, that's going to be lots of money invested. But we have the potential to create a whole lot more jobs. And reduce energy costs significantly. And this is, this, is, this is one of the first time I've had an opportunity to work on an environmental challenge where the solution actually can create more economic opportunity, 
can create can drive increased uh, incomes, and of course, um, uh, create a whole lot more jobs. And and if we can move to uh, zero emitting sources of energy or low emitting sources of energy, we can solve the environmental justice problem that exists across so many communities. We and if we are smart. We've got the opportunity to use research and innovation to figure out cost-effective ways where energy products can be, can be created to make sure that low-income households also get to participate in this energy transition that we're talking about. And I think achieving those outcomes represents some of the biggest opportunities on the one hand that we have but also the biggest challenges that we have that we, and, and so we, we have to succeed in doing this because if we don't, we worsen the equity problems in this state. And, 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 and the, the consequences of not addressing climate change, as we saw through, through Hurricane Harvey and all of the tropical storms and hurricanes that have occurred in the Houston region, the, the cost of that, I mean, I mean Last in 2020, the federal just the federal government spent a hundred billion dollars in response to extreme weather events caused by climate change. And probably by the time you add everything that consumers spent and that local government spent and that state spent, that gets us way above a trillion dollars. We don't have the financial resources to continue to do this over and over and over again. Thanks, John. That's, I think, a really great sort of segue into, I mean, John pretty much just described what, what my job is in Houston, leading the Energy Transition Initiative, bringing together all of those different stakeholder groups to figure out how we solve this problem together. And one of the things I really love about being in Houston for this is how collaborative Houston has become and, and how focused singularly on this issue. Um, the city has become, and, and whether you're in the mayor's office or you're talking with the 18 largest energy companies in the city, or you're talking with the nonprofits and the NGOs, everybody has come to sort of that nexus of we have to solve for the climate crisis, and we also have to solve for continued energy usage. And, and do it in a way that creates opportunity. And so when the Houston Energy Transition Initiative was launched, it was on the basis of Houston as the energy leader having both the opportunity and the responsibility to solve this problem. And so I think you know when you've got some of the largest energy companies in the world that have made that net zero commitment, they've put themselves in that box this time. And so they are truly interested in figuring out how to make this work. And they are interested in making sure that as we do this, it creates opportunity. Um, you know, I think they're, they're generally um, smart enough to know that these are their customers as well. And so you know, coming up with the right solutions, bringing together the right groups of people will really be where the opportunities come. And I think, you know, we, we've seen it come together in Houston, but I'd also love to, to talk a little bit more about some of the ecosystems that you're each involved in and, and how they're playing out in this space. My goodness, Jane, I think you just gave me chills when you said that they <laughs> put themselves in that box this time and the, the, the desires there, because it, it's true. I think we, we're seeing it um, you know, regularly, and it, it's so encouraging. Um, when, when we started doing this work back in 2015, you know, I, I remember just you know, running a, a, around Texas being like, hey, we need to pay attention to, to energy and equity. And people would be like, yeah, we've, we've got low income programs. We've, we've got an energy efficiency program. We're, we're good. And I, I, it wasn't quite that, that crass necessarily, but you know, it, we were really striving for, to bring attention to this intersection of, of energy and low income communities and, and how we, we um, navigate this nexus. And I would say over the past, you know, several years, there's there's certainly been this this sea change, and there there is this alignment building, and it's amazing what happens when you you 
have people in the room who don't normally talk to each other or, you know, who, who may, um, you know, be on different sides of, of a particular issue, but if you can build alignment and build consensus, and I think that's what's happening with the energy transition, um, solutions, uh, innovation happens, and, and it's quite phenomenal. Um, we uh, at TEPRI lead uh, a group called the Energy Opportunities Coalition, um, which brings together um, utility program managers, affordable housing providers, environmental justice organizations, other NGOs, researchers, academics, and, and others um, really kind of focused on key topics in these intersection points. And it, it's big and it's complex. And, and what we found is it's, it's really valuable to have kind of different tracks that we're thinking about. Um, for example, in our last cohort, of the, the Energy Opportunities Coalition. Um, we had a, a group that was focused on housing and distributed energy resources. Um, we had another group that was focused on energy and health in that intersection, and then another that was focused on mobility and, and transportation. And what was so interesting that we found was there was so much overlap in, in those three groups, in those three cohorts, and everybody had, had something to bring to the table. Um, you know, members of community health centers were, were talking about cases that they would see of childhood asthma and the effects of, of poor air quality and, and really what that meant for their communities. Um, you know, there in the room with utility uh, energy efficiency program managers who would say, okay, how can we come together and make sure that we're providing more services for the people who need it? Um, so I think there are really some, some phenomenal um, uh, groups that are coming together now that are, are really breaking down some of the silos that, that have traditionally existed when we say that we're, you know, the energy sector is here and the housing sector is here and the health sector is here. Um, and really thinking about how can we quantify and leverage those benefits um, that are unleashed when we, we come together and co-develop solutions for communities um, that, that really have compounding positive effects um, in terms of economic development, in terms of, of um, helping lift people to, to better opportunities. Um, so we're seeing some, some really incredible change uh, there. I'll also say to, to the earlier point about working with, with cities and local governments, um, with, with state agencies, and even the federal federal government in, in terms of, I feel like there's a lot of alignment being built now to say how can each of these, uh, each of these players, so to speak, play their part to, to, to put in place the right incentives, to institute the right policies that enable some of these solutions to hit the market. So the, there is um, really exciting change happening, and like, like John, I'm optimistic. It, it does feel like we have a real opportunity to, to, um, to get this right, and it's too important not to. Um, I want to try to paint a picture utilizing a couple examples of talking about what this could mean, especially for people. But before I do that, uh, I, want to, I want to quickly, if I may, introduce someone who's here. Gavin Dillingham is sitting over there. He's real quiet. He's brilliant. <laughs> He serves as vice president of our energy and climate program. Right, wave your hand, Gavin. And I, and I, I wanted to introduce you because I'm going to come back and talk about some work that he's doing as, over, the next, over the next two or three minutes. Um, but let's talk about what this clean energy transition could mean for ordinary folks, right? Um, neighborhood air pollution is a big problem. The garbage trucks that run down your streets a couple of times a week in some instances, at least once, maybe twice. The, uh, the delivery trucks, the Amazon trucks, delivering products to our homes. The school buses that run through our neighborhoods five days a week, picking up kids to take them to school. Um, the transit buses, most of them use diesel fuel and they emit uh, uh, various types of pollutants, and some of them are, cause premature death because of the particular emissions that they, that they, that they, 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 as part of their exhaust, uh, and may also cause cancer. So what if we could electrify the school buses, the trash trucks, the, the metro, metro the, the transit buses, Amazon's trucks, UPS trucks, we could potentially eliminate, completely eliminate emissions from vehicles, which because of all of the, the regulations that were put in place 15 years ago that forced 
large companies uh, to reduce their emissions, transport emissions from vehicles and buses and trucks that we all use or, or drive is the largest source of emissions, including those emissions that cause climate change today. Vehicles are the largest source. But not only do we reduce, could, through electric, electrification of vehicles, do we reduce those pollutants that affect health, the health of people, but also the emissions that are causing climate change. And what if Jane and her colleagues succeed in transitioning large companies to, uh, to use either clean energy or low, 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 low carbon slash e, e, uh, other emission sources of energy? Phenomenally, and the impact is we simultaneously further reduce those emissions that affect public health and those emissions causing climate change. But one of the big challenges that we have is how do we make sure that all of the benefits of energy use, not just emissions, um, is pro are provided to all Texans. And, and, and that's one of our, I think that's one of our biggest challenges and as Dana said, one of our biggest responsibility. And one of the reasons I, I wanted to, to introduce Gavin is, is that five days a week, he and his team are working on utilizing research to figure out ways to how we can produce energy and use energy in the future. And in a way that those benefits that these trillion dollar industries are going to provide benefit everybody. And Dana, for a few moments ago, Dana talked about low-income households, four out of 10 households in Texans, uh, having to deal with energy insecurity or energy poverty. But Gavin has done work that shows that it is, it is feasible by creating a, 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 the necessary vehicle to provide solar plus storage to low-income households at less cost than they're currently paying for electricity. And, and part of what, and, and of course he worked with Dana and her team to do that. So, so we have the opportunity by collaborating with each other, collaborating with the Greater Houston Partnership and, and the companies that are working with Ann on these issues, we have the opportunity by, to collaborate and not only change how we produce and use energy, but, but make sure that every segment of our population benefit. And, and, and that's important because if you, if you look at various economic sectors, uh, persons of color have done less well in terms of employment opportunity in the energy sector than any other. And some of the best paying jobs have always been in the energy sector. And um, so, so and, and, and there is one other statement, and, and that's this. You know, my experience has shown me that if you can get the business community to move on these types of issues in Houston, it's just a matter of time before the business community in Austin and San Antonio and Dallas and Fort Worth and El Paso will do the same thing. And in this very conservative state, having the business community be, assume a leadership role on this issue is a prerequisite to success. And that's why I think Dana and I both are excited about what we see happening. And the key is to sustain it and make sure that it does happen. Really great points. And I will agree completely. Um, Gavin is pretty brilliant, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll third that. <laughs> so, as I think about, so I, I do want to share one example of something that's happening in Houston that I think is just a really great sort of illustration of how energy transition and equity comes together, and that's the, the Sunnyside Solar Farm that's in development. Um, you know, there's a there's a landfill that was placed in the middle of the oldest African-American community in Houston a long, long time ago. 
And it has sat dormant there in that community for over 50 years. And, and it was never remediated, nothing was ever done. I mean, back at the time when that landfill was shut down, there weren't sort of the EPA processes around, you know, closing them down properly. So this, this landfill has just sat in the middle of this community. And remediating it is an incredibly expensive issue for the city to take on. Um, and so they, they reached out and said, what could we do with this piece of land to do something useful with it? And somebody came back with a design to, to put a utility scale solar farm that would also have community scale solar elements on this landfill. And so in doing it in a way that would require minimum um, disruption to the ground, so minimum amount of um, remediation would need to be done, but taking something that is an eyesore and unusable and converting it into a significant source of energy for the Houston area, and then also a significant source of energy for homes in that neighborhood, and also a place with an education center where young people from that community can go and learn about renewable energy and solar and develop the skills to work in that industry. And, and I, said, I think about some of the challenges that we've faced, particularly since COVID began and, and in the context of what's happening in Europe right now. I think one of the things that we're recognizing is the more we can bring energy and manufacturing and production of things closer to home, the, the better the opportunities will be for people and, and the better the transition will play out. And, and I love the, the Sunnyside Solar Farm concept because it's just such a great way to bring all of those elements together into a, a single project within the city. And I'm just wondering, you know, how do we make more things like that happen? How do we get the right folks at the table to, to continue to find those opportunities to improve access to energy and at the same time improve access to, to great jobs in the community and, and also, you know, reduce the emissions and sort of hit on all three at the same time? I think, I think what we're finding is that by reaching out to local communities and leadership in local communities, folks want to see those types of developments. Uh, we are at HARC, we are, we are currently collaborating with a environmental justice group in, in Port Arthur, Texas. Uh, Port Arthur is a, is a town of about 45,000 people, but has, has within it the largest refinery in the world and the second largest refinery in the world and more industrial facilities. And so the organization that we're working with is uh, the community, CIDA, the Community Empowerment and Development Association. Uh, the president's goal is not to shut down industrial facilities, his, but he, he is a strong, the strongest possible advocate for those companies to substantially reduce their emissions, comply with state and federal requirements, and also invest in the local community. Uh, so one of the things that, as we, as we started working with him, he said, can you guys work with us to try to figure out a path for, for solar in Port Arthur? I mean, this is, this is a community where oil and gas is it. And so we, we you know, Gavin and his team uh, have, have great working relationships with DOE and put together an application as part of a competitive process. And we've gotten a grant to especially work to initiate solar uh, installations in Port Arthur, but then the president of, of, of CETA came to us and said, there's a lot of vacant land in Port Arthur. Can we figure out a way to build out solar on some of this land? And so I think, I think just by connecting with communities and first listening, and then there is a concept that we have begun to work through on, on, on initiatives, and that is co-production, which involve making sure we connect with the right people in the local community and lend them our expertise. And, and once we understand what, what their priorities are, help formulate strategies that they're interested in pursuing. And then the, they have a little, a, little, a, little, a little transit organization that has 12 buses 
and the, and the young fellow who is ahead of it, he's figured out a way, he's leveraged enough money from the federal government to completely electrify his 12 buses, but he need technical assistance to figure out the charging and all of that stuff. And, and we're now trying to figure out a way for funding so we could help do that, but go a step further. And that is, if you, you know, if you, uh, and then let me, let me make a larger point and then I'll come back to Port Arthur. Uh, Metro, Houston Metro has 1,300 buses. Uh, imagine, and during, during Storm Uri last year, those buses were not running. They were parked somewhere. Imagine if those buses were electric buses and there had been a resiliency plan to position them around the city before the temperatures got to be, before the snow and the ice. And, and instead of sitting idly uh, with their batteries having been charged up beforehand, where they could have provided electricity to hospitals and low-income neighborhoods and so forth. You know, one of the things that Ford, Ford has taught us about the, one, the electric 150, and that is if we had owned one during Storm Uri, it could have provided us electricity in our home for three days. So that's the amazing thing. That's another one of the amazing things that's happening with regard to electric transportation is that we, we will be able to deploy them uh, for various purposes besides driving them, uh, particularly in terms of building resiliency in our homes, but also in our communities. And so one of the things that we want to work with the, the little transit agency in Port Arthur is how do we work with them to figure out a way to one, work with the local utility to create a charging system for the buses, but also have them be part of a resiliency strategy for Port Arthur. So when there is the next hurricane that comes, and and the and Entergy is the local electricity provider, and 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 the lights go out, that there is opportunity to use those buses too as 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 resiliency centers, uh, especially for. A, a emergency operations and to provide vital services to the most vulnerable people who may live in that community. It's, but I think by, one of the things I learned from Dana and over my experience over the years is that if, if we take the time to reach out to local communities and become familiar with the local leadership and, and basically be willing to invite everybody to the table, it is amazing what you can do in terms of figuring out potential solutions that create economic opportunity, but solve all other community problems. And that's part of our challenge, is to get out of our offices and connect with people who live in various jurisdictions. And, and then if they're willing to uh, work with them to forge solutions to uh, the, the problems that they may face. I, I completely agree. Um, I, I think that's really well said, John. And you know, communities know what they need. You know, they, they know what their priorities are. And I think even taking the, the Sunnyside example, the Sunnyside Solar Farm, and, and I, it, it's really a phenomenal um, uh, demonstration of what's possible. And I think a lot of, a lot of that, the solar classroom, the, the integrated efforts um, of that project are in part because of the local community. Um, you know, the president of the local community development corporation saying, you know, our kids are, we need to get our kids excited about solar. We need outdoor solar classrooms as part of this initiative. We need to pair um, aquaponics and, and agriculture so that we can we can feed the community as part of this initiative, and and really bringing in those things that that the communities care about and, and can help co-develop these solutions in a way that that really meets their needs, um, and you know. If we can find ways to, to pair those community needs and, and have community members be part of these processes, along with um, you know private industry and the the whole host of, of ESG goals that are being set now, and and if we can say hey this this these are the the types of strategies that work for the for those communities, th there's a, a lot that's possible, um, and and really we're looking for models and solutions that can scale. So how can we both learn from Sunnyside and then the, repeat that across the rest of you know, Texas's competitive electricity market? How can we look at some of the innovative things that are going on in Houston and, and have those scale to other parts of our, of our state, to rural communities and, and otherwise? 
One of the things that I think is so um, interesting about, about Sunnyside and the community solar model um, that I think is important to note is that it's also circumventing a lot of the traditional barriers to access to, to technologies like solar. Um, so the, those barriers are fa fairly well known, um, just in terms of, of um, when we think about rooftop solar, you know, you, you have to own your own home, you have to have access to financing to be able to, to finance that system. Um, you need to be able to monetize the tax credits um, in order to, to make the economics make sense, so you have to have enough taxable income um, for, for that to, to, to be able to, to uh, monetize those tax credits. And so when we kind of shift the focus of these projects and we stop saying, okay, how do we just, not just how do we get more solar out there, although that's important, but really how do we look at and work with communities and say, what are your needs in terms of both emissions reduction, but then also in terms of resilience? How do we pair storage? What creative solutions do, do we have? And how can we create a more vibrant um, uh, economy locally um, through those initiatives? Really phenomenal things can happen. The other part that I, I wanted to, to mention, and I, and I know I keep going back to housing, but in part because I think housing is such an incredibly important part of this puzzle, um, is that as we're looking about our energy needs and we're looking about access, looking at access to energy, we can also get smarter and more efficient with our consumption of energy. Um, when we think about the opportunities in, in residential, in our residential housing stock uh, in Texas, especially in low-income communities, there is so much potential for investment in housing that can reduce our demand and increase the comfort of residents in those homes while reducing strain on the grid um, and, and creating lower need for more and more and more generation. Um, in fact, our organization um, conducted a study in Harris County in the Houston area a couple of years ago looking at the potential for um, a couple of different technologies, including weatherization and energy efficiency, to reduce energy cost burdens. And what we found is we can, we can economically do it today. We, we have the technology, we know what we need, we know where the homes are that need weatherization, that need energy efficiency um, installation, but we need to be, get smart about how we deploy those programs, how we engage with communities and say, look, these are the programs that are gonna meet your needs. Um, and, and then also how we think about the grid benefits um, and how can we monetize the grid benefits of saying, hey, look, these investments aren't just for those homes, for those residents, um, but also for, for the grid as well. Um, so I think there, there is a lot of opportunity there. If we can pair um, these very hyper-localized strategies that are based on community need with these kind of broader, more macro forces um, that, that are, are we're driving the energy transition, there's a whole lot of opportunity to pull these things together and make sure that we're leaving no one behind. Thanks, Dana. I'm going to open it up to questions in just a minute, but before we do that, I just two questions that I've got. One, I, I'd love to hear what each of you think the biggest hurdle that we're facing right now as we really try to accelerate into the energy transition. You know, what's that, what's that one big hurdle each of us is facing in this space? And then what makes you optimistic? What are you seeing that gives you hope that we can actually achieve these goals and, and gives you um, excitement to see where we go in the future? You want to go first? Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the clean energy transition is going to occur. And, and, and one of the reasons is, is for example, wind and solar power are the cheapest sources of electricity today. So market forces, pricing and market forces will drive that. And, 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 and those are not the only solutions to this energy transition piece. But I think that while there's a need for a whole lot of research and development to be done to commercialize hydrogen, I, th I think that by in, by doing that research and development work, I think that we, will, we can forge ways to do it that's economical. Um, so I think, I, think, I think the transition is going to occur. The question, the question that I have is, can it be done equitably? Can it be done so that everybody, whether predominantly white communities, black communities, brown communities, Asian communities, you know, can we, what do we, and I think, I think political will becomes part of that, 
But I think we, we have to uh, forge that political will to make sure that we get this done. And, and, and I was just sitting here thinking a moment ago, well, you know, one of the things, I, I think I've heard, Ann, uh, I think I've heard, uh, Jane, that Houston is the most diverse city in America. It is the most diverse city in America. So the, the, the amazing thing is that if we can make this stuff work in Houston from an equity standpoint, where we have the most diverse population of any city in America, in a place that has been known as the energy capital of the world, how cool would that be? So that's my optimism. Thanks, John. Dana? Um, you know, the, the challenges are many. <laughs> um, and we, we've got a big job ahead of us, no doubt. But, you know, I, I would say the one that I am um, putting a lot of thought into and that I'm, I'm keenly focused on is, is really around alignment. Um, you know, this is a big and complex problem. And, you know, in our kind of increasingly chaotic and, and polarized world, you know, how do we come together and, and do this, align our efforts to make sure that we do shape an energy future that is equitable and works for people and the planet um, consistently? Um, and, you know, that, that can mean a whole lot of different things, kind of de depending on, on where you're sitting in the world and, and what the view is. Um, and I, I think that there's some really good work going on right now, even to define what do we mean by energy equity. Um, and, and while we, we're up here, you know, hosting this, this conversation, um, you know, there's still a lot of, of different opinions about really what energy equity means and, and what it looks like. Um, and I think there, there's, there is a need for an additional, additional alignment there. Um, and I did want to plug um, quickly, if I may, some work by some of our colleagues at um, ACEEE, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, who have done some, some, led some great work that our team has participated in, really defining energy equity metrics and, and what that means and, and look like. And it's it, really for their context, it's largely about energy efficiency, but I think that it can, can be applied to, to large parts of this transition. Um, and I'll just quickly um, offer that they, they really talk about procedural equity, um, which is, is just making sure that we embed inclusive and accessible engagement and representation in our, in our policies and our process and our program design so that the people who are most vulnerable and, and for whom these pro uh, policies are designed are at the center. Um, the, the second is distributional equity, so making sure that we know how to measure. We know what we mean when we say the benefits of an equitable energy transition flow to all communities. Um, that we, we can measure those and we can check ourselves and see what kind of job that we're doing. Um, and the, the third is, is structural equity um, and, and really recognizing that we don't have a great history in our institutions of equity. Um, you know, from, from the housing sector to transportation to education to, to jobs. Um, and, and really that recognizing that, that inequity that does exist in our system and, and that we um, need to find ways to, to come together and, and address those disparities. Um, they propose a whole host of metrics uh, under kind of each of those categories that I think are incredibly helpful. Um, so, so I think that challenge of alignment and just saying what, what do we really mean, what are we trying to do here collectively as society is incredibly important. And then in terms of what, what makes me hopeful or, or, or makes me optimistic um, about all of this is, you know, as we mentioned earlier, um, you know, back in 2015, when I think John and I started working on some of this together, um, it was a really different conversation uh, then in terms of, of thinking about what an energy transition could look like. Um, and I think the kind of collective um, momentum around this topic, and, and from all, all sectors, right? So, I mean, you, it, from the oil and gas capital of the world um, to state and local governments to um, you know NGOs like ours to, to communities themselves to, to my kids, right? It, it, you know, my, my daughters are thinking about an equitable energy future and, and, and what that means. And so I, I do, I'm, I'm optimistic because while I know we have really big and complex challenges ahead of us, I do think that there is this collective momentum and this recognition that we've got to figure this out and we've got to get it right, um, and that. That's really um, giving me, um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and, and looking forward to continuing to work on, on this stuff with, with you guys and, and um, with, with uh, everyone, everyone in this room. Thanks, Dana. 
So for me, I, I guess the, the piece that I see is one of the biggest hurdles is really around um, political will and personal behavior. I think we have become so um, encased in our convenience that we don't recognize that we have to make some significant changes um, when when half the population of the world is living on what what would be considered one light bulb and we have Christmas lights up for three months of the year and things come on constantly and we're making 16 trips out each each week um, lines of cars to drop kids off at schools all of those things sort of I see that and I think, man, I'm not sure we really have the will to make the kinds of changes that we need to make in order um, to achieve the goals that we need to achieve. And so I think there's a, a bit of learning there. Um, and, and there's a bit around the political will. But over the last six months, I have seen people start to have conversations that they weren't willing to have before. Um, and so I've seen people who have been very far apart start to find the middle. And somebody uh, that I talked to about a decarbonization project said the term radical middle ground to me. And, and it really is almost radical for people to be able to find that middle ground. But I feel like people are finding that middle ground suddenly and we're recognizing that we can't be all the way over here and we can't be all the way over here in order for us to be able to progress this transition effectively and equitably, we have to find that middle ground. And so for me, that's part of the optimism. But the other part is, gosh, over the last two weeks, I've seen more technology um, conversations and really, really smart people who are committed to figuring this problem out um, and doing it in a way that creates opportunity for such a broad range of, of folks. And, and that really gives me a lot of hope when I see people working on ways to bring together technologies that we'd never even imagined. Um, I saw ventures teams pitching ideas that I would have never fathomed a week ago. And, and then this week I've got guys talking about how biomedicine works with the energy system to create more efficient energy solutions. So there's just so much exciting stuff happening. Um, and, and that really gives me a lot of hope. Um, before we wrap up, just want to see any questions. I'd just ask if anybody could go to either the mic here or the mic in the back, just so that we can hear you with the questions. And you can just line up there. I think you might need to turn it on. Is it on? It's on. Hello? Yeah. Uh, my name is Philip. I work with Intersectional Environmentalists. That's our right there. Um, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. I'm very aware of the energy systems here. Um, I want to bring up one of the stats that John pointed out of 41% of Texans are living in some level of poverty, but also bringing up that the energy companies have seen billions and billions of dollars in profit. And I think a major part of equity is reparations to our communities for, from those profits and not just giving labor opportunities, but opportunities for communities of color and low-income communities to be leaders in the energy transition and to build power both literally and in terms of like building power for the communities. Um, because my concern is that if we still have 41% of Texans living in poverty with all of these billions of dollars in profit, if they are the ones leading the energy transition, we're going to continue to see these inequities in the transition. So how do we get these energy companies to invest those billions of dollars back into communities in a way in which it's not an investment for them to see profits on, but for them to give back to communities so that they can build their own power and make their own decisions and build their own tables instead of getting seats at the existing ones? So uh, I have some understanding of the issue of reparation. And uh, maybe it's, a, it's, it's tied to my having my 68th birthday yesterday. I, I'm not optimistic we will see that in this country because the fact of the matter is, is that our politics is incremental. And, and 
And so while I'm, I'm not optimistic, we will see policies put in place to drive reparations. I am optimistic that there is the potential opportunity to get energy companies to invest in, in, in low-income communities, again, many of which are persons of color. And so I th I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic that there is much to be done in that space. But um, so, uh, so, so that's kind of where I am on this. I, I, I understand the reason you would make your point. But but it's it's I don't I, I don't I don't see the political will to do that. So, you know, as the executive director of the Energy Transition Initiative in Houston, I work with a lot of those companies. And, you know, one of the things that they want to do is understand where and how. And so working with organizations like HARC. And, and digging in to understand how best to support an equitable transition. How do they go about it? Um, you know, I think, I think there is definitely an openness um, and there is a dialogue that's occurring that, to John's point, probably wouldn't have in the past. Um, so that, because there is a recognition that, and I think most of the, the major players have in their net zero commitments, have all also made commitments to an equitable transition, and they want to make sure that that happens. So I think there's a bit of we need to wait and see, but I think, um, at least from my perspective, the dialogue is beginning in a way that it hasn't before. Hi, I'm Sari Lacey. I'm a teacher in Southern Oregon. And I just wanted to thank you, first of all, because everything that you said, I just wanted to be clapping. <laughs> um, and so, John, you said something about uh, that their historically disadvantaged populations are not going into energy jobs. So I wanted to ask, what kind of energy jobs? Like, as an educator, how can I help to connect the dots? Are there any kind of organizations or programs that we could, you know, teach our students about in order to try to serve that need? Well, I, I you know, one of the, let me, let me talk about existing jobs from the fossil fuel industry. You know, part of the work that we're doing in Port Arthur is, um, um, there's a lot of jobs in the craft trade sectors where people are starting off with about 40000 to $50,000 a year, but after the first year with training, because of overtime, can make over $100,000 a year. So the guy that we're working with at Port Arthur, while he's interested in moving to clean energy, you know, he recognizes that the refineries and the chemical plants are going to probably be around for the next 25, 30 years. And so his whole deal is unemployment in the African-American community in Port Arthur is the highest in the state. Can we put together a job training and placement program to especially place uh, folks who don't have college degrees into those craft trade jobs because you don't have to have a college degree? And, and his, what he says to me is that, boy, if we could place 500 Port Arthur residents into these craft trade jobs, it will change the trajectory of economic opportunity in Port Arthur. Um, secondly, with regard to the clean energy transition, I, I think one of the things that we need to put in place, and I'm talking about the Broadway, is, is create collaboratives that include the wind developers and the solar developers, and to challenge them on this issue. Because they, if, if we don't challenge them and if they don't change direction, we will have the same type of equity employment in, that, in those emerging industries as we have seen across the energy sector. So, 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 so I think we gotta, we gotta bring together the solar and the, and the efficiency and the, and, the, and the wind guys and also probably with local governments, to try to make sure that we, we make sure that those industries get on the right track. But with regard to existing jobs in the fossil fuel industry, there is much to be gained in the, over the next 10, 15, 20 years by working with 
energy companies, petrochemical facilities, uh, to train and place uh, unemployed and other unemployed persons into jobs, particularly if they live close in, in close proximity to those facilities. With that, we're going to have to close it out. But thanks, everybody, for being here. It was a really great discussion. I hope you enjoyed it. And I really want to thank Dana and John for being here and exploring this conversation with me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.